fact, my mother-in-law tried to ruin my marriage. Now I'm cutting her out of our lives for good. P, my relationship with my mother-in-law has always been complicated. From the moment I met her, I knew that we were different in many ways. She was a traditionalist with a strong sense of family by using a belief in the importance of women's domestic roles. I, on the other hand, was more independent-minded with a career of my own and a sense of ambition that didn't fit into her idea of what a wife and mother should be. We shared a vision for our future together, one that included building a life that we both loved. As much as my husband and I loved each other, there was always a shadow cast over our relationship by my mother-in-law. Even before we got married, she made her disapproval of me clear. She criticized everything, from my job to my clothes, and always seemed to find fault with me. After we got married, things only got worse. My mother-in-law would drop by our house unannounced, expecting us to drop everything to entertain her. She would criticize the way I kept the house, the meals I cooked, and even the way I dressed. It was as if she wanted to undermine me at every turn to prove to her son that I was an inadequate partner for him. But my husband never wavered in his support of me. He always stood up for me and defended me even when it meant going against his mother. He saw how much her behavior hurt me and did everything in his power to shield me from her negativity. Despite this, my mother-in-law continued to cause drama. She would make snide comments about our relationship, casting doubt on our love and our future together. She even went so far as to suggest that my husband should leave me and find someone more suitable. It was exhausting and hurtful. It felt like no matter what I did, I would never be good enough for my mother-in-law. I began to dread her visits and to feel like I was walking on eggshells around her. As time went on, my mother-in-law's surprise visits became more frequent and more unbearable. I could feel myself becoming more and more anxious every time I heard her car pull into the driveway, knowing that I would be subjected to her criticism and negativity. Finally, I reached my breaking point. One day, after my mother-in-law had left our home, I sat my husband down and had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with him. I told him how much his mother's behavior was affecting me how it was causing me to doubt myself and our relationship, and how I felt like I was walking on eggshells around her. To my relief, my husband listened attentively and didn't brush off my concerns. He acknowledged how difficult his mother could be and expressed his frustration with her behavior. We talked about how her surprise visits were disruptive to our lives and how they made me feel like I had no control over my own home. Together, we decided to have a conversation with my mother-in-law and set some clear boundaries. So we agreed that it was important for us to have some control over our own lives and our own home and that her surprise visits were no longer acceptable. So when we sat down to have the conversation with my mother-in-law, my heart was pounding with nerves and anxiety. I knew that she wouldn't take the news well, but I also knew that it was necessary for our well-being. So my husband took the lead and started by expressing his love for his mother and his appreciation for everything she had done for him. He then gently brought up the topic of her surprise visits and how they were causing stress and tension in our household. At first, my mother-in-law was defensive and dismissive. She insisted that she had every right to visit her son whenever she wanted, and that we should be grateful for the time she spent with us. So, but my husband held his ground and calmly explained that while we appreciated her visits, we needed to have some control over our own lives and our own home. As the conversation continued, tensions rose and emotions ran high. My mother-in-law accused me of being controlling and manipulative, and she even went so far as to suggest that I was trying to drive a wedge between her and her son. But my husband didn't back down. He defended me in our decision to set boundaries, and he made it clear that our relationship was important to him, and he would do whatever it took to protect it. As the conversation came to a close, my mother-in-law was visibly upset and hurt. She accused us of not caring about her and of being ungrateful for everything she had done for us. But my husband calmly reassured her that we loved her and that we would always be there for her, even if we needed to set some boundaries to protect our well-being. Despite our conversation with my mother-in-law, things didn't always go smoothly. There were still times when she overstepped your boundaries or caused unnecessary drama. One such instance happened when my in-laws came over for dinner one night. My husband had cooked a delicious meal and we were all enjoying each other's company. But then, suddenly my mother-in-law started to act strange. At first, she complained of feeling dizzy and nauseous. We offered her water and tried to make her comfortable, but she kept getting worse. Soon, she was doubled over in pain and gasping for breath. In a panic, my father-in-law suggested that we take her to the hospital. We all rushed to the car and drove there as quickly as possible. My husband and I were terrified and confused, unsure of what was happening to his mother. When we arrived at the hospital, my mother-in-law was rushed into the emergency room. Doctors and nurses swarmed around her. We were all on edge, waiting for news on her condition. But then something strange happened. As we waited in the hospital room, my mother-in-law suddenly accused me of poisoning her food at dinner. She claimed that I had added some kind of toxic substance to the meal, and that it was the cause of her sudden illness. My husband and I were dumbfounded. We knew that it was impossible as he had cooked the meal himself and we had all eaten the same food. But my mother-in-law was insistent and she even went so far as to call the police to report me for poisoning her. It was a surreal and traumatic experience. My husband and I were in disbelief, trying to defend ourselves against these outrageous accusations. We were exhausted and emotionally drained from the whole ordeal. 
As the doctors began to examine my mother-in-law, they quickly realized that there was nothing wrong with her. They ran a series of tests, but everything came back normal. It was clear that she had fabricated her symptoms in an attempt to make us look bad and get her son to leave me. My mother-in-law's plan to get her son to leave me backfired badly. Instead of driving us apart, her accusations brought us closer together as a couple. My father-in-law was in disbelief. He couldn't believe that his wife would go to such lengths to cause drama and hurt our relationship. He apologized profusely and assured us that he had no idea that she was planning something like this. My husband and I were shocked and hurt. We couldn't understand why my mother-in-law would do something like this, especially after we had just had a conversation about setting boundaries. It felt like a betrayal, and it was hard to come to terms with the fact that someone we loved and trusted could behave in such a manipulative and hurtful way. We were also relieved that the truth had come out, but the damage had already been done. Our relationship with my mother-in-law was irreparably damaged, and it was clear that we needed to keep her away from us in the future. As we left the hospital that day, I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness and disappointment. I had always hoped that my relationship with my mother-in-law would improve over time, but it seemed like we were destined to be at odds with each other. When we reached home, a heavy silence hung between my husband and me. I could tell that he was feeling guilty and ashamed of his mother's behavior, and I didn't know what to say to make him feel better. Eventually, we arrived home and my husband sat me down on the couch. He looked at me with pained eyes and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that's happened. I'm sorry that my mother treated you so poorly, and I'm sorry that I didn't do more to stop it. I can feel tears stinging at the corners of my eyes, but I refused to let them fall. Instead, I simply nodded my head and told him that it wasn't his fault, that he can't control his mother's actions. My husband shook his head and said that he knows that, but he should have done more to protect me, that he should have put his foot down and set clear boundaries with her. He said that he should have been a better husband. I reached out and took his hand and told him that he is a great husband and that he has always been one. I told him that this wasn't his fault and he couldn't have known that she would do something like this. He looked at me with a mix of gratitude and sadness in his eyes. He said that he just felt like he had let me down. So he said that he wanted to give me the perfect life, but instead he brought me into this mess. I squeezed his hand reassuringly and told him that he didn't bring me into anything, that I chose to marry him because I love him and I know that we can get through this together. So we sat in silence for a few moments, just holding hands and trying to process everything that had happened. Finally, my husband spoke up again. He promised me that he would do better and that he will stand up for me and cut his mother off completely. I looked at him with a small smile on my face. I told him that I knew he would do it and that I would always be here to support him no matter what happens. The mother-in-law is emotionally abusive and manipulative. Crazy woman. Cut her off immediately. NTA. Mother-in-law has severe attachment issues. Bro, if not worse. Her son knows who he married. He didn't want a traditional wife. Clearly, look at his mother. The woman doesn't have a life, so she's trying to ruin her son's and OP's lives. Next story. I, female 29, babysat my nieces and nephew, male four, female six, and female seven, the day before Christmas Eve so that my brother and his wife could go to a nice dinner. They left around 6 p.m., so all I had to do was watch a movie with the kids and then put them to bed. I decided to watch Polar Express with them. All went well. And they were very excited about the movie. But I figured that was just kids being excited. Fast forward to Christmas. I got a frantic call from my brother yelling at me for showing the kids that movie. I didn't know this, but apparently there is a set of train tracks that run behind their house about 200 yards back. And on Christmas Eve, my nieces had snuck out of bed and walked out to wait for the Polar Express. My brother put them to bed around 10 and found them at 6 a.m. unwrapping presents under the tree. He realized they'd been outside because their coats, boots were strewn about the hallway, and their faces were pink from having been out in the cold. They didn't know how long the kids were out there. Doctor estimated about one and a half hours and took them to the ER because my younger niece's lips were blue and she was stumbling to where they found out that my younger niece had, thankfully, mild hypothermia. My brother is beyond angry at me. They recently moved to this house and I've never visited before Christmas Eve since I live in the city and they're about two hours away. So I've never seen the house in daylight and had no idea there were train tracks near it. It never occurred to me to say that the movie wasn't real. All the kids still believe in Santa, so I didn't think there was any harm in showing them a Christmas movie. I've gotten mixed reactions from people. My husband says it's not my fault and it's completely on them, as does my father and sister. But my brother and my mom think I'm the worst person in the world. I feel really awful and don't know what to do. Ita, read it. Ta, your brother blames you because he doesn't want to accept that he's responsible. His kids snuck out of the house while he and his wife were responsible for them. That's on them. Parents are responsible for teaching their children about the dangers of leaving the house unsupervised and for train track safety. Parents are responsible for making sure their children know the difference between fact and fiction. Parents are responsible for communicating restrictions to babysitters. You played an age-appropriate Christmas movie. That's your only part in this. This is not your fault. Ta, they're the parents here and the kids snuck out on their watch. Your brother is desperately looking for anyone to blame but himself. 
It shouldn't have been on you to talk about movies not being real. It should have been on him to teach his children to never go outside. A. In the dark. B. Without an adult. C. Without parental permission. D. All of the above. Not to mention teaching them to go nowhere near train tracks for heaven's sake. I guess try to cut your brother some slack for the horrifying time they just had during the holidays, but he owes you a major apology as soon as he gets his head on straight. As does your mother. Next story. I, 27, female, have a friend called Beth. Beth has a boyfriend, Michael, and they've been together about nine months. I now live abroad, but I was spending December in my home city to see friends, family. Since Beth got together with Michael, Michael has become quite a good friend to me also. When I visited them at the beginning of December, Michael was talking about the company he'd recently joined and how it was kind of an old boys club type place. Family, money, nepotism, baby, work hard, play hard, city types. And he was having quite a hard time bonding with his team, especially his boss. He talked about the upcoming Christmas party and then said his team all night because they tended to tease him about him not understanding their conversations. He mentioned a popular holiday destination a lot of the team had been to over the summer where I have holiday before, and I was explaining some things he said had come up in the conversation. He suddenly suggested that I come to his Christmas party with him and help him bridge the gap with his colleagues. Beth immediately agreed. Here's the thing. I asked Beth four times during that dinner if she was okay with this, and she said yes. I asked her three times over the phone the day after when she was alone, and she said she was fine with it, and I was saving her from a stressful evening and doing something nice for Michael. I went to the party, and actually it was a nice evening. Michael and I were not physical at all, obviously, but we are friends, so it was fun to hang out, and his team are exactly what you'd expect. A little out of touch and immature, but good fun for an evening. Michael thanked me profusely, even sent me flowers saying how much he appreciated it. I really thought I'd done a good thing. Ever since Beth has been ghosting me, I sent her several texts to meet up while I was in town and she ignored my calls and messages. I figured I'd speak to her about it in the new year, but yesterday when I sent her a Merry Christmas text, she replied with a wall of texts saying I had a nerve to try to be her friend after I completely destroyed her self-esteem and how she can't believe I actually went to the party. I pointed out that I asked her multiple times if it was okay and she said yes, but her point is I should have just said I should have should have known that it would make her feel bad that Michael wanted to use me to impress people. I'll admit I suspected it did make her feel bad, but when she was pushing me to do it anyway, I presumed she'd put her own feelings aside. My fiancé says that's not my fault and that Beth should have been honest instead of expecting me to read her mind. But a couple of my friends say I should probably have just said no in solidarity. A-I-T-A, N-T-A. Beth is a grown-ass woman, and if she had a problem with it, she should have used her words like an adult during one of the multiple times you asked if she was okay with it, saying she was fine with it, and then expecting you to read her mind is an a hey move. She sounds very immature. You helped out a friend, that's it. If she has a problem with it, she should take it up with Michael. S. Chain. I was waiting for the part where Beth was not available to go, like out of town or something. Michael is in a hole for asking someone else to pose as his girlfriend because presumably you're more conventionally attractive than his real and completely available girlfriend. You for not realizing this was weird and rude to her. Her gentle one for not speaking up that she wasn't okay with it. So my story, my husband and I've been my, been married for nine years. In 2021, we found out my husband was being soiled sailed support. Turns out my husband had an affair shortly after we were married. It nearly ended our marriage, but we went to counseling together and I agreed to stay in the marriage with the following provisions. My husband was to get a second job so that his child support payments did not affect our household budget and that at no point in time would I ever consider having a relationship with this child. If he wanted to, fine, but I have absolutely zero interest in this kid. So my husband has been getting to know his kid over the past couple years and recently my husband came to me and informed me that there was some sort of baby mama drama. Apparently she has to self-surrender in May and is going to be incarcerated for eight months. My husband told me that he needed to take custody while his affair partner is locked up. Otherwise, the kid would have to go to their grandparents who basically live on the opposite coast from us. Their kid doesn't want to have to change schools or be so far away from their friends, dad, and mom. She will be doing her time fairly local to us. So after my husband told me that, I got up and left the house. I went to the grocery store on the corner and grabbed a copy of our area's apartment guide, went back home, and handed it to him. So he asked if I were serious. I told him I still felt the same way as I did three years ago. He said he didn't think that was fair considering the extenuating circumstances. I told him I don't care about the circumstances. His kid is not welcome in my home. If he wanted to take custody, I will grant him an amicable divorce, but I am not changing my mind. I am not taking care of some other chick's kid. Eat it for all the people concerned about what a whip cracker I am in work two jobs. He has never had a full-time job since we have been together. He works two part-time retail jobs now that add up to 40 to 50 hours a week. He currently only has supervised visitation with his kid. They see each other once or twice a month for a couple hours with a social worker present. And for those who seem to think that I need to be the one to file for divorce, no, I will not. I am not the one who created this situation. If my husband wants to pursue custody, I have told him I will not fight it. I will grant him an amicable divorce and let him be on his way. 
However, I am not going to waste my own time, energy, and money to do so. He is responsible for getting his own ducks in a row for the situation he created. That includes being the one to go through the headache of filing. Update. After posting, my husband and I continued to discuss the situation. I held firm and it iterated again I will not live with a child, and if my husband wants to pursue this, he will have to find other housing. We discussed divorce. We discussed temporarily separating. We discussed a lot. We sat down and had a pretty big financial talk. He is not involved in our financial planning. I showed him the numbers he realistically had to work with. I told my husband the truth that while I love him, I won't lose sleep if we divorce. He has to do what's right for his own happiness and his kid. My husband had a bit of a breakdown over that. There was a lot of crying and him telling me that he loved me and didn't want to lose me. I broke down myself. We had a real good cry together. He asked if we could go back to our marriage counselor. So, I made an appointment. We went. We discussed the same things above, but with a counselor present. It basically boils down to my husband being very overwhelmed and conflicted about everything. He confessed he didn't really want to be an active parent but feels like he is supposed to. There's some deep stuff in there about his own family and race tied into that. So complicated emotions. He is terrified of losing me. He wants to prioritize our marriage. Hearing me say that I wouldn't lose sleep over divorcing left him shook. Our counselor strongly suggested that my husband get into individual therapy and gave some referrals. My husband has not pursued that. It did become pretty obvious to my husband that he was not in a place mentally or financially where he could take full custody, though. So, the kid is now in Virginia with maternal grandparents. My husband was actually going to go and visit the kid for their birthday this weekend. I gifted my husband some of my airline miles to buy his plane ticket. I did his laundry last night while he was at work so he'd have clean stuff to pack. However, my husband dropped the ball on his trip. I had a plans for this afternoon that I left early for, so I wasn't home when he was supposed to get up and leave. He stayed up late playing video games last night and overslept. Ended up missing his flight and couldn't afford last-minute tickets on another. My husband cheated with our son's girlfriend. Now, I'm determined to end our marriage and rebuild my life. I, 41F, am a stay-at-home mom. My husband, 48M, whom we'll call Paul, works in finance. We have been married for nearly 20 years. We have two kids, whom we'll call Eric, our 18-year-old son, currently a senior in high school, and Mary, our 15-year-old daughter. They are both the lights of my life. My marriage with my husband has grown somewhat stale over the years for a myriad of reasons, such as his work schedule and how I've aged poorly since we first met. Our son Eric has a girlfriend, 18F, whom he's been dating since they were freshmen in high school. We'll call her Amy. Eric absolutely adores Amy. She's his first love, and she's someone I've always considered as family. This makes the whole situation emotionally excruciating for me. Last week, I inadvertently saw my husband's phone screen and got a glimpse of a text thread between my husband and Amy, our son's girlfriend, and I read what looked like a message of her telling him that she misses sucking his big can. I froze in place in complete disbelief. I spent most of the day convincing myself that I must have misread what I saw. However, I didn't misread it because, over the last several days, I discovered a file on his computer filled with tons of adult videos. He clearly has an adult videos addiction. He also has saved photos of Amy from her Instagram on his computer. Although they weren't inappropriate, she was fully clothed. It was still the proof I needed to confirm that I wasn't going crazy. I also looked at his phone during opportune moments and saw more of their interactions. I wish I had never looked. They were filled with mean, horrible things said at my expense with him constantly comparing me to her. He would call me fat and old, among other things, with Amy lollings, had hunches, a wee was killings that Paul has been cheating on me, but never in a million years could I have fathomed something like this. Last month, I found a thong in our bedroom that I know wasn't mine. I turned a blind eye to it, being naive and acting like it was maybe our daughter's even though that made zero sense. Not only is he cheating on me, but he's betraying our son. I'm completely devastated, I don't even think words can adequately describe the dread, anger, shock I feel right now. I'm totally overwhelmed on how to handle this because obviously action needs to be taken, but I'm terrified of what kind of psychic blow this will be for my son. I have no idea how to even broach this completely fucked up topic with him. I wouldn't wish this predicament on my worst enemy. I can't even believe I married this scumbag in the first place. And then my mind started to race, realizing that I started noticing specifically unusual behavior from him around the same time Amy turned 18. Was he waiting for her to turn 18 before pursuing this affair? There's so many layers to all of this and I'm completely paralyzed with fear and dread about it all. None of it makes any fucking sense. How did this happen? Am I that much of a stupid idiot that I let all of this happen under my watch? Eric adores Amy. And the thought of revealing this sickening truth to him terrifies me. The impact on his young heart and mind could be devastating. 
My heart aches for Eric and Mary who are completely innocent bystanders. I haven't confronted my husband about this because I'm frankly scared of the domino effect. I don't know who to turn to first about this. I share my story not for sympathy, but in search of understanding and perhaps advice from those who might have had to grapple with deep betrayal. Thank you for listening. Update, I am divorcing my husband. I told my kids and I spoke with Amy's mom. My brother connected me to a very tough junkyard dog type lawyer. I saved screenshots of all his conversations with Amy, so I was only able to get the last three months from my cloud. The conversations were mostly flirty and dirty talk. It was hard to stomach, completely sleazy, and I saw several negative things said about me. His call history showed he talks with her for hours pretty consistently. He uses dating apps. I took screenshots of his profiles and all of the active chats has with his matches. It's very clear he uses a filter to seek out girls who are 18 to 22 or so. I copied all of his files from the computer. He goes on sex chat rooms and forums, and he spends a ton of money on OnlyFans. I rummaged through every possible hiding spot I could think of in the house. He had various toys, blindfolds, cuffs, lubricants, etc. He also had different outfits which looked kind of like a girl's Catholic school uniform and a French maid type outfit too. I picked up Eric and Mary from school, and we all drove to my brother's. They were able to sense something was Ari when I picked them up. I delicately told them the entire situation, and I broke down crying. Mary had the most anger, even more than Eric. I met with Amy's mother and told her everything. She confiscated Amy's phone and gave me the entire chat log. It only dated back three months ago like on my husband's cloud, almost as if they both deleted the messages at the same time. She told me Amy sobbed when confronted. Amy basically told her mother that she will never understand and that she and him are in love. I don't want to get into too many details with what else she was saying, but suffice to say, it's very easy to assume that my husband slowly and methodically became a sage-like figure in her life, making her feel she could rely on him, and he took advantage of the fact that she came from a broken home. Amy is also non-stop insistent that their friendship only became romantic slash physical recently, and before that, she said he was more of a friend and mentor. I confronted Paul over Zoom. The look on his face was scary. She became red and looked so sweaty, he had anger and panic in his eyes. His tone of voice was very defensive and frightening. He kept yelling the word context over and over again, and that none of that happened. So he was unable to speak without constant stutters and intensity. Nothing really made any sense to me. I refused to tell him where I was, and he said I had no right to take his kids away from him. And then he abruptly left the Zoom. My lawyer is filing for temporary sole custody of Mary and a restraining order. The Mary is still the most angry. She's totally furious with her dad and Amy. Justifiably so, of course. The Mary is recollecting moments and times she watched her dad interact with her friends, and she's in knots about it. Eric is very clearly hurting, but he's so strong and very level-headed. He wants to see a therapist. The maturity my kids are showing makes me proud. They don't deserve this at all. We made the authorities aware of everything. I plan on being completely unforgiving and ruthless in this divorce. I'm reflecting on how I've been treated and how it's made me a shell of myself and how I've had a very negative opinion of myself because of him over the last 20 years. I don't want to let this scumbag get away with it. I want to reinvent myself and move on stronger than ever. Update number two, divorcing my husband who cheated on me with our son's 18-year-old girlfriend. Update on Amy, Eric, and Mary. Thank you again for all the love and encouragement. It gives me comfort and means so much to me. I've received many comments and messages accusing me of faking this story, which oddly also provides comfort because all of this feels unreal even to me. It validates my own feelings that there are people out there who can't even fathom this being true. I wish it were fake. I've been focusing on and worrying about how others are feeling over this, somewhat ignoring my own feelings which I'm trying to change. I range from anger to numbness like a light switch. We're all safe and still at my brother's house. We're very careful. And his house is secured. Paul has tried to call my cell phone several times a day. I am refusing to interact with him, and I will have my lawyer handle all correspondence. He scares me, frankly. My brother has a very secure house with an alarm system and deadbolt locks. We feel safe with him. Both my son and I got checked out and tested. It appears so far that we're both clean based on the immediate rapid tests, but in the coming days, we'll know for certain when the lab results come in. I'm not overly concerned. Eric is scheduled to see a therapist early next week, which is very good and needed. He's not himself right now. He seems a bit shell-shocked, and I am concerned. He internalizes a lot, and it's hard to get a read on what's going on in his head. That being said, he's thoughtful and has been talking with me, asking me how I'm doing and everything. He's not interested in corresponding with his dad at all. He calls only my cell phone, and he hasn't tried to reach out to either Eric or Mary. I get the sense that Paul is extremely nervous. He's scared, and I think he deep down knows that if investigated thoroughly, he would be in big trouble. That's what my gut is telling me. I still think about the Zoom call with him, and the more I think about it, the more it looked like he was a man whose entire world was crashing down on him. The panic in his face was very apparent. I offered Mary for me to make an appointment with a therapist as well, 
but she doesn't want to see one yet. She said she's open to it eventually but wants time to herself. She's been asking her friends about her dad and if they experienced any creepiness from him. Her friends were open and honest with her, and apparently they felt like he stared a lot and sensed his hovering presence whenever they were over. One of Mary's friends went so far as to say that she felt like he was checking her out a lot, like looking at her rear and complimenting the color of her yoga pants. At the time, no issue was brought up about it, but in light of everything that has been happening, it seems strange now. He would sit himself in different areas or vantage points to get a good view of her, she claimed. He also asked questions about what kind of friend group or which clique they were in at school. He kept asking about if they were popular girls. I'm completely embarrassed that they had this experience at our house. As for updates on Amy, which is the main reason why I wanted to write this update, I completely agree that she is also a victim. A lot of people have been emphasizing that, and I agree. I've done everything I could in my own power to indirectly get her opportunities to get help. Like I said, I told her mother, and she's been updating me on everything. Amy, unfortunately, is still living in her deluded reality and I can only pray that she'll eventually come to her senses. She doesn't want to see any doctors or therapists at all and has been constantly trying to reach Paul because, again, she believes that they are in love. From what I've been told, she hasn't been able to get hold of him and he's been avoiding communication with her completely. Amy blames me for that and believes I took away his devices and am very controlling. Any truth that her mother tries to convey to her is met with conspiracy theories and hostility. Amy looks at me as a villain and still sees Paul through rose-colored glasses. Her mother showed her screenshots of his dating app profiles and matches, and she refuses to believe it, saying I photoshopped it. According to her mom, Amy keeps saying things like everyone is just mad because she found herself a real man and that I'm jealous because she takes better care of him than I do. It's in line with some of the conversations I screenshot where a lot of what Paul says is him complaining about things I don't do for him sexually. Right now, she's insistent that she and Paul will be together in the long run. Ugh, he's honestly a slimeball. I can only hope that Amy comes to her senses, but me directly intervening doesn't feel like it would be productive at the moment. Maybe eventually, though. Update number three. Divorce is underway. Eric's seeing a therapist routinely and Paul slash A meeting up again. The support, again, has been overwhelming, and I'm very grateful. Sadly, I've received a lot of negative slash accusatory slash harassing private messages from people here who think I'm faking this story. Someone made a comment on some post somewhere claiming that my story has been debunked and people believe that person. I've seen an uptick in negative messages accusing me of making this up for money. I'm not asking for money at all. Coming here was completely rooted in emotional desperation and I didn't expect anyone to get invested in my story this way. But again, I'm not looking for anything out of this. I have no reason to lie. I'm not gaining anything from this. If you don't believe me, that's fine, I don't care, but the only thing I ask is to not cross the line and start sending me private messages that are mean-spirited or accusatory. The only reason I'm continuing to post is because of those of you who've sent me love here, and the support really lifted my spirits. As for the divorce, it's very much underway. I'm not going to get into the specifics of it all because it's ongoing, and I want to make sure everything is going to go smoothly. I got temporary custody of Mary. Paul also has to pay temporary child support. There's a protective order. Paul can't contact us or come near us. Right now, we're just focusing on getting through this legal mess. Again, not getting into specifics because I don't want to mess anything up. But what I'll say is I'm very confident, divorce aside, that there's overwhelming evidence against Paul that will get him in serious trouble and it will impact him for the rest of his life. I'm sure eventually I can share more about that. I know a lot of people are concerned about his predatory ways, and I just wanted to convey this, even though I have to be vague right now. Justice will come. All of your concern about how my kids are doing psychologically means a lot to me. Eric has been to therapy twice over the last two weeks. I know some people thought I was dismissive of him and acting like he's doing okay. Was then okay? I very much know that he's hurting internally, and we're doing everything we can to make sure he knows he is supported and loved. So my brother has been amazing in spending time with Eric and Mary, and both of them have confided in him about a lot. My brother has a very healthy marriage, and both he and his wife have really stepped to the pub to the plate for all of us. Mary has not seen a therapist yet, but she promises that she will be open to seeing one soon. Her anger has mostly turned into sadness, I noticed, and I hope I can get her to see a therapist soon. Oh, our friends have played a key role in this whole thing, and that's something that Mary has been grappling with as well. I know a lot of people are invested in the well-being of Amy as well. There were a lot of questions about whether Eric and Amy would still see each other at school. Ah, it sounded like they go to the same school, but they do not. Ah, 
Eric and Amy went to the same junior high school and knew each other even then, but Amy ended up going to an all-girls Catholic high school while Eric, and Mary too, stayed in the public school system. We all lived in the same town, and over the summer heading into freshman year is when they were getting to know each other and when they started dating. I wish I had a better Amy update, but it's gotten a lot worse since the last update. Paul has actually been seeing Amy, despite her mother trying to force her not to see him. She tells me that Amy says she's 18 and an adult, and she can do what she wants. Her mother is in a precarious spot because if she kicks Amy out of the house for defying her, something that she has threatened to do, which I think is a mistake, she would just run to Paul permanently. The time she spends with Paul has increased over the last week, despite the fact that Paul initially ghosted her when all of this first hit the fan. There were some days where Amy would just be gone for hours on end. There's only so much I could do with the Amy situation, but again, I do believe things will turn around soon with that, given what I know about Paul and what's to come. I can only pray that Amy can get help and guidance when more shit hits the fan. I'm doing everything I can with my own kids and my own mental health, and Amy's mom knows she has my support, and that's all I could really provide. Next story, stepdaughter passed away, and then I caught my husband cheating with his ex-wife. But now she's gone too. My stepdaughter Becca, 14F, died four weeks ago. I've been in her life since she was seven years old. We were extremely close. My husband Derek, 40M, his ex-wife Sam, 38F, and I, 35F, get along very well. There's never been an issue in the seven years that I've been with Derek. Sam has always been kind to me. She didn't even care that Becca called me mom too. Right after Becca's passing, Sam had so much anxiety and depression that she was unable to be by herself. She has no family besides us, so we invited her to stay with us. Sam hardly leaves the house. She mostly just sleeps in Becca's room, which is completely understandable. I always tell her that I'm here if she needs me and that I want her to take her time with grieving and that there is no pressure to go back to her home. Today I needed to run some errands, so I asked Sam if she'd like to join me to get out of the house a little bit, but she declined and said she'd rather just stay at the house and sleep. I told Derek that I was leaving and that I would be back in two-ish hours. He works from home. I also told him to check on Sam every once in a while and maybe try getting her to eat something. Uh, after stopping at the post office, I realized I forgot my library book that I needed to return, so I went back home to get it. As soon as I walked in the door, I heard moaning coming from mine and Derek's bedroom. I immediately knew what was happening, and my heart completely broke in that moment. I wasn't completely sure what to do, but I ended up deciding to confront them, so I walked to the bedroom and opened the door and began yelling at them both. Sam started having an anxiety attack and ran to the bathroom while Derek kept apologizing profusely. I asked him what the hell was happening. He told me that he made himself and Sam some lunch and they began talking about Becca and shared some memories. And then Sam ended up kissing him and he didn't pull back and then it ended with them in our bed. They're begging me to understand that it was just grief that caused them to become intimate and that they both made a mistake. I don't know what to do. I love this man. And I love Sam. I'm heartbroken that they did this to me and put me in this position. I feel so stuck. Update. I posted an update to r slash true off my chest but didn't realize there was an update rule so it was removed. I figured I'd post an update to my profile for those that follow me. I decided that I'm filing for a divorce. I can't ever trust him again. It sucks because we had an amazing relationship, I thought. He's always been great, so this was a complete shock to me. Last night, Derek came over to talk. He confessed to a lot. Turns out it wasn't their first time sex like most people thought. They've been having sex since three months before Becca died. I am completely shocked and heartbroken. Sam also reached out last night, and thanked me for everything I've done for her, and told me she was sorry. I didn't respond, I blocked her. I did so much for Sam and considered her a friend, so this hurts a lot, more than I can handle. This is all too much. As hard as this is gonna be, I need to leave Derek and cut them both out of my life. I am ready to do so. I am done. Also, some people are saying I deserve this, because I should have known better than to let Sam into our home, around Derek. But you need to understand that I'm a giving person, I trust people more than I should, I truly thought Sam was an amazing person. I know it's unusual to become friends with your husband's ex-wife, but it's just how it went for us and I shouldn't be blamed for what happened. Thank you to everyone who commented nice things and for the kind messages. You've all been helpful during this insanely difficult time. I appreciate it. Update 2. I'm getting questions about some things, so I figured I'd answer a few of them. Have I told anyone about what happened besides my mom? Yes, I told a few friends and some family members. Most of them are supportive of my decision and aren't speaking to Derek. Where is Derek staying? Currently, he's staying at a hotel. Our friends refuse to let him stay with him. He's lost a lot of people due to his awful decision. Has he tried fighting me on getting divorce? Yes, he begged me not to file for divorce. But when I told him I needed him to just let me go and that I was too exhausted to fight him on this, 
He let it be and agreed to getting a divorce. Why isn't Derek staying with Sam? He told me he didn't want to continue to hurt me, so he told Sam he was done with her for good. And that they have no reason to speak to each other anymore. I have no idea if that'll last or if they'll just end up together, but I truly don't care what they do anymore. I just want peace. What was Derek's excuse for cheating? He told me that they just accidentally reconnected one night when I was away at my mom's. He was stressed we weren't conceiving and were having miscarriages, so he vented to Sam, and then somehow that led to sex. Disgusting of them both, I know. Feel free to ask anything else and I'll try to answer. Thank you everyone for your support and advice. More updates. I just found out that he is staying with Sam and not at the hotel. He told me it's too expensive to stay at a hotel, and Sam is the only one that'll help him right now. I had a feeling this would happen. Just knowing that they are still probably sleeping together hurts my heart. I talked to a lawyer this morning and we are proceeding with the divorce and Derek agreed to it. It's actually happening, and I feel some relief that he's not fighting me on this. My mom leaves on Sunday. I'm scared to be alone. But I go back to work on Monday, so I'm hoping it'll be a good distraction. I'll keep updating if anything else happens. Thank you, everyone. I am so grateful for you all. Becca's diary. I decided to go through some of Becca's stuff today. I just found her diary in a box in the back of her closet. Would it be wrong to read some of it? I feel like it would help me feel closer to her, but part of me feels like it's wrong too. I haven't told Derek that I found it either, and I'm unsure if I should tell him. What would you do? Update 3, I figured it's been a few days, so I should give a little update. My mom is leaving in a couple hours, so I'll be alone. I'm kind of nervous about it. She helped me stay distracted and kept me going. I'd cow I'm gonna handle her being gone. I go back to work tomorrow, first day back since Becca passed away. I'm looking forward to it, though, because it'll keep me distracted. Also, I did read some of Becca's diary. It made me love her even more. She was such a sweetheart. I went back a few months and saw that she noticed some weird behavior between Derek and Sam. Didn't mention that she knew of the affair, but she just wrote that she thought it was kind of strange that they all three would hang out more than usual, without me. I might read more, but so far I haven't found anything that's disturbing. Just her being a teenager and talking about crushes, fights with friends, happy family memories, etc. Tomorrow I'm also talking to my lawyer, so I might have more updates on that. Thanks for the continuous love and support, everyone. Update 4, last update for a while. Started randomly getting a lot more messages slash comments, so I figured I'd do another little last update. My first week back at work went great. I wasn't expecting it to go so well, but thankfully it did. My coworkers were so helpful and patient with me. On Friday night, I decided I didn't want to stay home all weekend alone, so I decided to drive up to my mom's. It helps I have a three-day weekend, so I can spend more time with her. I'm heading back home tomorrow. Also, for those of you that have messaged me hateful things for reading Becca's diary, I just have to say you aren't in my shoes right now. Telling me I'm a bad mom because I'm reading her diary is just ridiculous. I learned so much more about her, about how caring and sweet she is, and it made me love her even more. It's how I'm able to feel so close to her right now, so please don't tell me I'm a bad parent for just trying to get by one of the hardest times of my life. You have no idea what it's like. I don't have much of an update, so this will be it. I'll come back and update once the divorce happens, though. Thank you to those of you that have been nothing but kind and helpful. You help me feel less alone. I'll forever be grateful. Update 5, Sam saw my Reddit post and is threatening to sue in. Sam made a fake f by profile to message me and tell me she wants to sue me for telling strangers about what happened. Derek supports her, apparently. I don't need this. Am I not allowed to vent about my life to people online? I just want life to get better. I'm so tired. Fuck you, Sam. Fuck you, Derek. Eat it. Sam is in the comments and messaged me on here, too. Blocked her. Update 6. I don't think I can do this anymore. I have been as strong as I can be, but I have been really struggling. So much is going on and I'm just so tired. How can I keep going? I just want to be with Becca. I miss her. I miss her smile. I miss her laugh. I miss how she'd try to make you laugh when you were sad by telling dad jokes. I miss how she liked being in the garden with me. I miss seeing all her new drawings. I miss her beautiful eyes. I miss everything about her. I just want her back. I need her back. Edit. I am okay. I just needed a space to vent. I was getting so many messages asking if I'm all right. And I just wanted to say thank you to those that reached out. I am okay. I will be okay. Some days are harder than others, but I think I'll get through this. I'm so grateful for the little community I have here. Thank you all so much. My dad skipped my wedding but crashed my baby shower dressed as a clown. Now I'm cutting him out of my life for good. My dad's been pretty hit and missed my whole life for supporting me. He was what I call a volunteer parent, but not in the way step parents can be. Supportive for a kid that's not theirs. He was just there when it was the most convenient for him, which is never a sign, but I always loved my dad anyways and I typically made excuses as to why he wasn't around. When I was a kid, I'd pretend he was like a super secret spy, and he couldn't always be around because he was always saving the world. What a joke that really was, though. I had a wedding. 
You would think this would be some super important do not miss unless you die event in your child's but apparently not to my dad. At the last minute, he texted me that he had to have an emergency meeting with his ex-wife. He didn't even have the balls to tell me to my face that he wasn't going to walk me down the aisle. I'm his only daughter, so this is a one-of-a-kind opportunity that you would think he wouldn't want to miss. There should have been nothing more important to him than his daughter's wedding. Of course, I am nothing short but livid that he wasn't there for me that day, so who can really blame me when I decided that I didn't want him at my baby shower? Of course, my mom says baby showers aren't actually for men anyways. My mom says baby showers are typically just for the women so that they can celebrate the baby and bring gifts and whatnot. This sounds completely crazy to me in general, but now my dad is throwing a complete hissy fit because I was not going to invite him. I really don't even know who told him I was pregnant. I certainly didn't because I didn't want him around and I felt so utterly disrespected by his lack of caring about me. If he didn't want to be there for my wedding, why on earth should I allow him to be there for my baby or baby shower? I don't want to let my child have the same disappointment that I had from his grandfather. Now though, my dad's threatening to ruin my baby shower if I don't invite him. I'm not completely sure how he expects to do that exactly though. If he wasn't at my wedding during my most important day, why does he care to be at my baby shower? Actually, why does he deserve to be at my baby shower? He's never actually been there for me. Maybe I should just have a complete talk with him to explain my views. I doubt it will actually do anything, but you should always try, right? Update one, I finally had a talk with my dad. I was able to ask him what was so important that he had to leave my wedding to go see his ex-wife. He wouldn't explain to me what happened to her or why he walked out. This is actually really typical for my dad. He never tells the whole truth. Why start now? But at least he did actually apologize though and said that yes, he should have been there for my wedding. I'll take what I can get at this point with him, I guess. He said he was acting so rash about coming to my baby shower simply for the fact that it was my first child. It was a boy and he really wanted to be there for my son. He sounded so sincere when he told me why he wanted to be there. It's completely possible that I could be getting played yet again with this whole ordeal. I really feel like he's being sincere, but I don't know. I don't think he still deserves to come to my baby shower. Of course, I don't want him to miss out on anything since it's his first grandson, but I really need him to show some initiative here. That being said, during our meeting, I told him that I had to really think about everything before I gave him an answer on if he could come or not. He's my father. If he wants to be there in that way, I want him to be there. But it's also a question of if he actually wants to be there. Is he going to let me down and not show up after all he's threatened and I'll just have to let him back in? Or is he going to actually show up and be what he's supposed to be as my father? Anyways, I guess I'll figure it out. I want to do what's right for me, not what will make him happy. Update 2. Alright, I made my decision. I decided he can't come. I can't continue to let myself be subjected to his constant disappointments. Either he shows up in my life or he doesn't. He can't continue to get my hopes up just to let me down. I'm going to tell him that I can't do this anymore and that he's not invited to my baby shower. Well, that went about as well as you figured it could go. I told him in person and he walked off without another word to say. I figured, of course, that he was mad and I can understand the fact that he was mad, but I hoped he would just go cool off and that would be that. Of course, for my dad, that wasn't the case. My guests and I got to the baby shower and everything was going really well. We played games and we were in the middle of opening the presents before eating and then continuing more games afterwards when someone walked in wheeling a box. The box was wrapped and looked just like a big present. The man appeared to be in a delivery uniform, which was okay. I assumed that someone had bought maybe a stroller or who knows, maybe even a crib and it was being delivered as those items can be pretty big. Boy, was I wrong. The delivery man got the box to me and I started to open it, but the box started to move. This of course really shocked, scared me. The box tumbled off the platform, busted open, and my dad popped out. Not only did he pop out of the box, but he was dressed like a clown of all things. He kicked out of the box all haphazardly looking like he was drunk. After kicking out of the box, he jumped up and tried to do like some weird ass dance. He ran around the room screaming and singing for several minutes, annoying my guests. Then came back to the front of the room where I was and yelled to everyone at the party that he was my father and that I had denied him an invite to my bee shower and that he didn't know how I could be such an ungrateful daughter. This obviously upset me. I'm pregnant after all and now my father comes in looking and acting like a complete idiot, embarrassing me in front of all my guests. I broke down crying. I literally broke down crying and got up and just ran out of the side door. I am at a loss for words about how anyone can be so insensitive to another person's feelings. What's worse is he made me out to be the bad person in front of all my guests when it's him who didn't come to my wedding. He's the one who was never there for me. The moment I choose to do something for myself instead of putting out an olive branch and allowing him to be there, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I am at a complete loss for words and my father is the worst person in the world. 
I've decided from this point forward to just cut him out of my life. He's never been there for me and he always ruins everything in my life. I will be much happier without this volunteer parent being in my life or my son's life. I will not allow him to be treated the way I have been. Good for you, girl. Female empowerment. I'm sorry, but I agree with your dad. How cold are you to not invite him? Maybe he had a right to behave the way he did. My husband William and I have three children. Charlotte, 22, female. Sebastian, 11, male. And Leo, 7, male. Our rule is that if a child is in school, then they do not need to get a job or pay rent. If they have finished school, then they need to have a job and pay rent. Charlotte got her associates last year and isn't interested in any more school. We offered Charlotte a deal that she could either pay a $1,500 monthly rent. We live in a very expensive area, so $1,500 is less than half of what most people pay every month for rent. Or she could help with Sebastian and Leo and not have to pay any rent. Charlotte chose to help with her brothers and not pay rent. William and I asked Charlotte to drop off and pick up Sebastian and Leo from school on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, as well as any needed appointments. We reimbursed Charlotte for the gas she spent driving them. William and I do not go out very often, maybe three times a month. We always got Charlotte's go-ahead before making plans and asking her to stay home with Sebastian and Leo. Last month, William and I planned to meet with a friend for dinner, but our friend had to cancel last minute for an emergency. We decided to go back home and immediately noticed that Charlotte's car was gone and Sebastian and Leo were in the front yard playing. When we asked where Charlotte was, Sebastian and Leo explained that she had left earlier and they were locked outside. Sebastian and Leo told us that Charlotte leaving them home alone was a very normal thing, but they didn't say anything before since they didn't think it was a big deal and also liked being home alone. William and I kept trying to call Charlotte, but she was not picking up. About a half hour before William and I planned on being home, we had been calling her for over three hours at this point. Charlotte pulled up in the driveway. William and I told Charlotte she cannot babysit Sebastian and Leo anymore. She's lied to us for over a year and destroyed our trust in her. Charlotte is now paying $1,500 in rent every month, which helps cover the cost of Sebastian and Leo's nanny. Charlotte got frustrated last Friday and told William and me how unfair we were for making her pay $1,500 on top of doing chores. We told Charlotte if she wants to live in this house, then those are the rules. If she doesn't like it, then she can go ahead and walk out the door. Charlotte's biological mom, Phoebe, called William and me awful parents and accused us of choosing our new children over Charlotte. Phoebe posted a rant on Facebook voicing this opinion. Friends have reached out to us because they know we aren't favoring Sebastian and Leo over Charlotte. But they said that we were too harsh in telling Charlotte to either deal with our rules or walk out the door because it's a hard thing to hear from your parents at any age and we should try to work out a compromise. But Charlotte broke our trust and lied for over a year. I don't see how a compromise would solve anything. Ada, some additional information because several people have asked. Charlotte works as an ultrasound technician and earns about $5,000 every month. In our area, most starter homes cost more than $3,000 every month, not counting utilities. Phoebe moved two hours away after Charlotte turned 18, so a commute from Phoebe's house to Charlotte's current job is obviously impossible. That is Phoebe's reasoning for why she cannot take Charlotte in and expects William and I to just let what Charlotte did slide. It looks like there's been some confusion when I say starter home. I'm referring to a studio apartment or a single room in a shared apartment. Charlotte gets a massive discount living with us compared to if she lived on her own, especially because we provide her utilities and food at home. NTA? She's not a child, she's 22, and leaving the two younger kids home alone could get you in a world of problems depending on the rules in your state. She's been irresponsible apparently for quite some time. In the beginning, she had a choice of arrangements. She chose the child care option and then didn't hold up her side of the deal, so you put her into the other option of paying rent. It's not like you kicked her out, which you totally could have done, technically since she's an adult. If her bio mom is so invested in her living arrangements, why doesn't she offer a spot in her home? And if paying rent and doing some chores seems onerous to her, she's going to have a rough time dealing with full-fledged adulting when she's on her own. Seems to me the compromise here is that you're still letting her live in your home at all, SMH. NTA, you told her her options and she chose to look after her younger siblings, then she actively went behind your back for over a year not fulfilling her end of the deal. Also, leaving the boys at home and locked out of the house seems to be the norm for her while you were out of the house. It's lucky you discovered what she was doing before something had happened to the boys. Also, $1,500 a month is nothing in a city that is expensive. If it's a major city like the one I live in, then that wouldn't even get you a studio apartment. So really, she shouldn't be complaining because if she had her own place, she would pay rent, utilities, cook her own meals, and then still have to do chores. People saying you shouldn't charge your children are also the ones who get shocked when their adult children are not independent and still rely on them in adulthood. I'm 46, female. My daughter just turned 17 last week.
She loves surprises, so I threw her a surprise party. I called, texted, contacted all her friends, and invited them. My daughter has been best friends with Matt, 17, male, since elementary school, and they started dating two years ago. Matt is a really sweet boy and he treats my daughter very well. I called Matt to tell him about the party and he was a bit confused. He told me that he and my daughter had broken up two weeks ago. That was news to me. My daughter was still going out at least twice a week, always telling me she was going out with Matt. She had even told me she was going out with Matt the night before I called Matt. I still have no idea where she's been going and it's very concerning to me that it must be something bad because she's keeping up the ruse that she's still with Matt. Plus, she's been hanging out with some new people in the last few months. One of them is a person who my daughter used to joke about being a hard drug addict. She doesn't make those jokes anymore, but she used to make them very seriously and frequently, so that concerns me. I didn't say this all to Matt. I apologized for calling him and told him to have a good day. Before I hung up, he asked if he actually could come to the party as he really wants to talk to my daughter and she's been distant at school. Again, Matt is a really good kid and he's known my daughter for a long time. If she was really into something dangerous like drugs or alcohol abuse, which sadly runs in my family, talking to him might be able to help her out. So I told Matt he could come to the party, but he had to leave if my daughter asked him to leave. Well, the party was last week and my daughter was surprised by all her guests, but she got really mad when she saw Matt. I saw her having an angry conversation with him and he left shortly after that. After the party, she told me that she and Matt were broken up and she couldn't believe he had come. I told her that I had known they were broken up, but I invited him because I thought it might be good for him to talk to her. She was livid. She called me a terrible mother and she's been cold to me ever since. I understand how I could have hurt her, but I still don't know if I was fully in the wrong in this situation. I love her more than anything, and I really wanted to do what was best for her. I'm sort of lost, so I was hoping you all could give me a judgment so I can understand the situation better. Ada, Yuta, you invited him thinking they were dating. Fine. He told you they were broken up, so you assumed he wasn't coming. Fine. He asked if he could come anyway. Correct response? Let me ask my daughter if she wants you to come. Edit. If it wasn't a surprise party since it was, then it should have just ended there. Instead, you snuck it on her, manipulatively. There are a lot of other things floating around this situation that is concerning stuff that you aren't wrong about and should investigate more, but that was what your question was about, so that's the ruling. Why to? Instead of asking your daughter why they broke and asking if she was okay, you decided to invite Matt to her party. I can't wrap my head around how you thought it was a good idea and why you thought it would be good for your daughter to have him there. You automatically took Matt's side and thought you'd make his feelings and wants, if he wanted to talk to her, a priority over your daughter's. If she didn't want to talk to him, I would 100% have my daughter's back and not invite him. Did you even consider that he did something to your daughter to cause them to break up? Doesn't sound like it. How can you have so little disregard for your daughter, her well-being, and her wishes? Is this a pattern for you? Is there a reason your daughter withholds information for you? I used to do that with my parents and it was because they never trusted me. They took everyone else's side and punished me when they didn't agree with the choices I made for myself. If Matt hadn't told you about the breakup, then you wouldn't have been the A, but because she didn't tell you either, so it would be her fault. But you have said you were indeed informed of the breakup and you had only heard Matt's side of the story. Even if you think you know someone, there's always a chance they would do something you didn't expect. Maybe Matt managed to really hurt your daughter during the breakup and seeing him again therefore really upset her, regardless of whether he hurt her or not. Springing a confrontation upon her at an event that is supposed to be positive and a happy occasion for her is not okay. This was not the time or place for them to talk out their issues, even if she was informed beforehand. Next story Mike, 40F husband, 42M Jack, invited our niece, 22F Holly, his sister's daughter, to stay with us for a month. She was laid off and her mom was pressuring her to find work. He wanted to give her space to decompress and think about next steps. I love Holly. She's wonderful. I'm happy to host her and I am excited to see her. I took issue with Jack extending the invitation without looping me in first. He informed me after the fact. Some background. I'm the primary caregiver for my parents and grandma since October 2021. They are disabled, don't drive or cook. My mom has had a slew of medical issues with 15 hospitalizations in the past three years plus. Um, visits I've lost count of. Two of her admissions she was in ICU on event and almost died. It's been stressful. I'm at the hospital daily when she's there and am her advocate. I'm her only child and all responsibility is on me. I've been severely burnout for the past year juggling their needs and working a full-time job. Jack is aware of my burnout. We started IVF in January, which adds another layer of stress. Jack works from home. He's required in the office three weeks a year for scheduled events. One of those weeks was Holly's first week here, which meant me stepping up to do the majority of work as hostess, cooking, etc. 
On top of caregiving tasks and IVF acts, Holly's worth it. But given the stress in our life right now, I wanted to opt in by my own choice versus being voluntold by Jack. And when he told me she was coming, I expressed only excitement. After her being here two weeks, I spoke with him because he was checked out about her visit and not communicating. For X, her first week here, he had to work late three nights due to events he knew in advance. I found out he wouldn't be home until 10 p.m. when I text him at 4, asking what time I should have dinner ready. The second week, he was supposed to work from home. I found out at dinner Sunday night because I asked a question about planning not because he told me that his schedule changed and he was driving into the office the entire week. That night, I expressed frustration at his lack of involvement in her stay. In the middle of the argument, I said something like, you invited her without giving me any say. The least you could do is communicate proactively or book some tickets for the things she wants to do. I've made all the plans, purchased all the tickets, and made all her meals. He said, you want me to ask permission for someone to come to my house? I said it wasn't about asking permission, it was about communicating with his wife. He said, we have a real problem if I have to ask you permission for someone to visit me in my house. I repeated it wasn't about permission, it was about treating his spouse as an equal and a partner. We've not yet resolved the conversation because we won't argue in front of Holly. None of this is her fault and I don't want her to think we are arguing because of her. ATI wow. I woke up to so many comments. Thank you all for taking time to read this and comment. I will read all of them, but it may take me a bit. Some quick info based on the ones I've read so far. Holly is 22 but is young for her age. I don't know if this matters or not, but she isn't from the U.S and grew up in a country where it isn't safe for her to go out and explore on her own. My in-law's words, not mine. Because of that, she isn't very independent slash confident. She just got her license in a car one to two years ago. I hadn't considered letting her go explore on her own here, but it doesn't mean it isn't feasible. That decision I'd probably leave in her and Jack's hands. Also, when I said to my husband, I've cooked all her meals, what I meant, and he knew this, was dinner. I see how that's not clear how I wrote it. She has been cooking for herself and cleaning after herself during the day, breakfast and lunch. My parents have specific dietary needs and I have to make them dinner anyway so I didn't ask her to cook. She did offer to help with prep several nights and I took her up on that when she offered. She did make me lunch two days. People were asking how much Jack normally helps around the house. We pay for cleaning service in our home twice a month and lawn service for our yard twice a month because we don't have the time. Normally he and I split making dinner, three nights each and one night we get takeout. He used to be fine with this but has gotten increasingly annoyed slash grumpy about it over the past one to two years. Because my dad is a finicky eater and I suspect he is also feeling burnout. I drive my family to 90% of their appointments. But if I have a work conflict, he will move things around to take them and does not complain about that. He handles all things grooming and vet for our dogs, we split pet feedings and potty breaks between us. He does his own laundry and ironing but defaults things like sheets and kitchen towels to me. He washes the dishes after dinner every night even if I tell him to let me do them sometimes. I make sure 90% of the bills get paid and handle the groceries. There has always been a selfish streak in him that flares over certain things but he can also be very thoughtful and considerate, especially with gift giving or planning dates slash celebrations like birthdays. It has also taken a significant hit since my mom fell ill. He is not an incel though he might sound like it in my post. IVF. I will read all of these comments and consider them deeply. We'll also share the sentiments with him and see how he feels and what he thinks. We don't take the responsibility of becoming parents lightly. It is also something we both always wanted. Even with the added stress and chaos that littles bring. Perhaps because of my own upbringing it doesn't feel insurmountable to care give and be a mom. My mom and I moved in with my grandparents after she and my bio father divorced. He was abusive and totally absent from my upbringing. The man I refer to as my dad is my stepdad. My grandfather was disabled on one side from a stroke and my grandmother care gave for him, and also helped her mother-in-law, a great aunt, and an older third cousin with no children with their groceries, errands, driving, etc. The difference being she was retired, and all those women lived in different homes. I understand the unequal partners and disrespect red flags, which was why I posted here to see if my feelings were valid. And I will spend time reflecting on all of this before we start or postpone our next cycle. Thanks for watching till the end, wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.